let me just share my screen. So how's that, that coming through okay? Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, so thanks, David. Um, um, as, as, as David just said, I'm, I'm Michael. I'm a postdoc at the University of Wollongong. Uh, and I'd really like to extend my thanks to the organizers for inviting me to talk about, about uh, some of the work we're doing here. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna talk to you about the work we're doing on estimating the sources and sinks of trace gases, particularly CO2. Uh, we've built a system for this problem called uh, WOMBAT, uh, which stands for Wollongong Methodology for Bayesian Assimilation of Trace Gases. And I hope that if nothing else, you walk away from this talk, appreciate, appreciate, appreciating our ability to torture the English language and, and create acronyms. But anyway, we got Wollongong in it. Um, so let's go. Uh, well, there are quite a few people involved with the work. Um, the key members of the team are myself, Andrew Zamet Manjon, and Noel Cressy in statistics, uh, all at Wollongong as well. Uh, we have an atmospheric chemist on the team, Jenny Fisher, and also an IT specialist, Yi Kao. Uh, and as you can see, the team is uh, quite multidisciplinary, uh, which is really needed when. Um, as you'll see when we talk um, about some, uh, some of the details of the work. Uh, there are some other key members, Matt Rigby at Bristol and Anne Stavitt at CSIRO, both atmospheric chemists. And of course, we've had help from a lot of other people in, in, in um, related communities around this problem. Uh, some of their names are here. But now, um, yeah, let's set the scene. So um, I'm sure I don't need to convince you of the importance of climate change, uh, but here are some quotes on the topic from the IPCC, uh, which of course coordinates special reports on climate change every few years. Uh, and I'll, I'll just read it. So um, human influence on the climate system is clear and recent anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases are the highest in history. Continued emission of greenhouse gases will cause further warming and long lasting changes in all components of the climate system. Uh, now I highlight the second point because it links to the graph on the right. And this is the ongoing record of carbon dioxide concentration measurements taken at Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. And it's called the Keeling Curve after Ralph Keeling, who pioneered work on collecting these data. Uh, and it shows how CO2, the main greenhouse gas, continues to go up and up. And this is a curve we need to control or, or really bend and flatten uh, in order to avoid what the IPCC is warning about. And, and you might say, oh, well, okay, we, we've controlled other pollutants before and, and fair enough. Um, but um, the challenge with CO2 is that unlike other, some other pollutants, it, it doesn't stay put. So local emissions become a, a global problem. Uh, and this is an animation that I'll play shortly that illustrates that. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll imagine emitting CO2 over the month of January, 2016 from, from North America. Um, and, and that's in the top left plot, you can see um, the emissions and space, their spatial distribution. Um, the total emissions so far through the month are in the bottom left, and then after one month, the emissions will stop. Uh, and then on the right, we'll see the effect that these emissions have on the atmospheric concentration of the gas. So I'll just play the video. Um, so initially, we've got the emissions happening. You can see concentrations are um, highest around where the emissions are happening. Uh, now the emissions are stopping and it's just spreading out. The gas is spreading out over the hemisphere. Um, it takes a few. It takes a few weeks, and then it's 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 reasonably spread out over the northern hemisphere, and then over several months and years, it it spreads over the whole globe. Um, <clears throat> and and the point of showing you this is, is that um, uh, it doesn't take very long for CO two emitted um, in a particular uh, location to become a global problem. Uh, and it's not just true for North America. We can't just blame the angst for it, 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 it's true for CO2 emitted anywhere in the world. Um, so a local problem becomes a global problem. And uh, consequently, um, um, the uh, um, uh, efforts to reduce CO2 emissions have to be, have to be global. Um, we, it, it's not enough for any, any, any one player to, to, to deal with it. Everyone has to deal with it. Uh, and, and, and of course, part of uh, controlling something is, is understanding it. Uh, so what we really need is a detailed understanding of, of where CO2 is emitted, and those are the sources, um, but actually also where CO2 is absorbed, um, uh, which we call sinks uh, of CO2. Uh, and because it turns out that uh, the biosphere is actually absorbing a good chunk of the fossil fuel emissions uh, that we're emitting, and we really need to know when and where um, um, those, uh, the biosphere is, is doing that. Um, um, yeah, so 
So let's talk about that. Uh, well, the problem with it, the problem with just going out and, uh, and measuring CO, CO2 sources and sinks is that fluxes are, are really hard to measure directly. Um, there, there are techniques, but, but they, they're very point-based. It's hard to measure them over large scales. Uh, for man-made sources of, of, uh, of, of CO2, there are, there are quite good proxies, like, like energy usage data at national levels um, that, that uh, are good for helping you estimate how much uh, CO2 is emitted from um, man, uh, um, anthropogenic sources, uh, but it's not true for natural source and sources and sinks. They, the natural um, sources and sinks um, um, are over a, a very large um, area and very, very long time spans. Um, um, so, so we can't just go out and, and use proxies very accurately. Uh, but what we can do is measure CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. Uh, and characterize their spatial temporal patterns. We can do that. Uh, and then we can work backwards from those CO2 concentrations to estimate CO2 fluxes. Uh, now that process of working backwards is, is called flux inversion. Uh, flux is another term which I'll use for the rest of the talk for, for um, the emission or, or, um, or absorption of a gas. Um, and, and flux inversion is just giving the notion in the word, that, uh, the, the phrase that we're moving, we're moving backwards from, from observations backwards to, to the fluxes. Uh, so flux inversion, that's our topic. Uh, and, and to solve this problem at, at Wollongong, um, and of course we're not the only group working on this, there are lots of groups, but to solve this problem at Wollongong, we built a flux inversion system, uh, which of course, we, as you already heard, we called Wombat, uh, and it's based on statistical principles. Uh, that's what we think we really bring to the table. Um, um, and, and, and what I'll talk about now is, is um, the underlying statistical model underneath it. So you've already got a bit of the intuition, um, but, but I'll just introduce some of the points. <clears throat> uh, so, so the first thing is the thing we really care about, uh, and that's the flux field. And we call it Y1. Uh, most fluxes happen at the surface. So um, we index this field just by space and time. Um, uh, so it's a 3D field. Uh, and, and this plot, just, just to give you a feel for it, shows plausible emissions for, say, a typical January. Um, the colour shows the intensity and, the, and the, whether, whether it's a, um, an emission or a, or, or, or a source or a sink, um, browner sources, greener sinks. Um, and at this time of year, there are lots of emissions in the northern hemisphere because it's well into winter. Nothing is growing, but humans are using fossil fuels and, and so on. Um, and, and this is the flux field. So, so these are just, say, plausible starting values, but... What we're really interested in is, is estimating this uh, and we can't measure it directly, unfortunately. Uh, now, the next mathematical object is the mole fraction field. Uh, we call it Y2. And this is the concentration of CO2. Um, and now it's not just over space and time, but there's also a vertical component because the atmosphere has a vertical structure to it. Um, uh, and um, uh, and this plot shows um, a column average. So, so you sort of take an integral down that, that vertical column. It shows a, a column average of the vertical field for, again, just plausible values that may have occurred over three hours around midnight, uh, UTC midnight on, on a particular day. Um, um, and you can see a lot of action here. Uh, there are higher concentrations over China, for example, probably due to ongoing fossil fuel emissions. Um, there are large north-south gradients. Um, there's, there's a lot of this sort of stuff going on here. Um, and, and this is an object that, that we can more, more directly measure than the flux field. Um, now, there, there is a relationship between the flux field and the mole fraction field, which is actually exactly of the character that we already talked about um, when I showed the animation before. So this is just exactly the same animation again. Uh, yeah, so, so the two fields are linked uh, and, the, and the linkage is through a, an equation called the transport equation, which, which is this integral at the top. Uh, so essentially the mole fraction field is, is, a, is a particular integral of the, um, of the flux field. Uh, and, and that will come in, in, in important later on. Um, um, and uh, because we're statisticians, uh, we introduce an error term into this equation just to represent the fact that uh, we don't as scientists understand these processes of transport perfectly. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so, so that's the relationship. And then finally, there, there are the data. So, um, so he, he, here's some um, data from, from one day. Um, um, actually, these annotation, this annotation is wrong. It's not plausible values. These are actually real 
um, observations. Uh, but these are observations from a satellite uh, that we're working with, um, and we denote observations with Z2. Uh, and you can see that, that these observations follow the orbital tracks of the satellite. That's why they come in these sort of diagonal lines. That's, that's where the satellite's passing over. Um, um, that's the, the, the route that the satellite's um, um, tracking along. Um, and, and, and the thing about these observations is, is, is that they only give you a relatively sort of small snapshot of CO2. And, and, and even the size of the points here is not really accurate. It's actually quite a lot smaller what's being observed by the satellite. Um, and of course, these are data. They have bias, bias, biases and, and they're noisy and, and so on. So they're not, they're not perfect in any sense. Um, but the goal uh, in flux inversion is to go backwards from this Z2 through the mole fraction field that we saw, uh, and finally to get the flux field. Um, and I'll just take a moment to speak more about these data. Um, so these are from a satellite um, that NASA launched called OCO2. Uh, it just hit seven years of service, so it's been up for a while. Um, and some members of the team here uh, have actually been involved with that satellite project for a long time, particularly Noel Cressy, who I understand was at the launch of its um, predecessor called OCO not OCO2. Um, unfortunately, that launch failed. Uh, they launched a, a successor called OCO2. Um, and in many ways, OCO2 is a better name because it embeds CO2 in it. Um, but I guess that's a very expensive way to get a better name because the previous satellite failed at launch. So there you go. Anyway, so just to stop, I, I thought I'd, I'd put together what we have so far. Um, we've got the satellite peering down on us, hopefully hopefully thinking nice things about its creators. It, it, it gets these uh, soundings or measurements of CO2. Um, they go into a data model, um, which is composed of, uh, of um, the, essentially the mole fraction field plus biases plus correlated and uncorrelated errors. Um, um, and, and generally the biases we think of as systematic maybe and, and the errors are random. Um, and then we also have this relationship between the mole fraction field and the flux field uh, that we already talked about. Um, and, and the goal, um, I'll remind you, is, is to infer the flux field, Y1, um, um, uh, while, while, we're, while capturing and quantifying uncertainty. Uh, and we want to capture uncertainty, quantify uncertainty basically everywhere. Uh, so, so there is one conspicuous absence in the previous diagram, which is how we deal with the flux field. Um, uh, if, if we tried to infer the values of the flux field at, at a, a really fine scale, so the scale that our um, software runs at is two degrees latitude by 2.5 degrees longitude we, um, and hourly, we, we'd end up with about 300,000 unknowns a day. If we tried to do that for two years, which, which we're doing later on, we'd end up with about 220 million unknowns, which, is, which would get pretty difficult. Um, so we deal with that uh, by applying some dimension reduction. Um, and the dimension reduction we use is to represent the flux field using a basis function representation. So um, in particular, we decompose it into three parts, the flux field, this Y1. Um, we have a prime mean, uh, and then we have basis functions that vary with space and um, or vary with uh, regions and months. Um, and then those basis functions themselves are fields uh, and they're scaled by alphas, which are considered unknown, but the prime mean of alpha is zero. Uh, so the idea is that um, the prior mean of this whole field is, is Y1, um, but you can adjust it by adjusting the um, these, using these basis functions. Um, and then finally, we have an error term because we're statisticians and we always have an error term. Um, and, and then we add a little bit more structure by allowing these uh, alphas, these scaling factors, to have some temporal structure within, within a region. Um, so that's a bit more dynamic. Um, the, the regions we use are these uh, 22 regions called TRANSCOM3 regions. Uh, they've been used previously, um, so pretty conventional for us to do that, um, but I thought I'd just show them so you can see. So um, the idea is that um, with each of these regions in each month will have a scaling factor. Um, it doesn't mean that we assume that there are, say, constant emissions within the region. Um, they're, they're, we're actually just scaling a basis function, which in principle can be smooth. Um, this is just how we parameterize it. Um, yeah, so we can put the whole hierarchical framework up now. Um, several, several layers here. Um, there's a, two process models um, that get at the, 
underlying um, quantities, the, the, the flux process model and the mole fraction process model. Um, and as always, when we're working with data, we have a, a data generating process or, or a data model, um, which we already saw before. So that's a, the framework, one slide, you've got it all, you can go and, you can go and implement it. <laughs> um, there's lots, lots more under it. A um, little bit of maths just to explain what's going on. So, um, um, and how we actually solve this. So first, um, as we just said, there's a basis function representation for the mole fraction field um, and this integral relationship between the, uh, sorry, excuse me, the flux field. There's a basis function representation for the flux field um, and an integral relationship between the mole fraction field and the flux field. Uh, the nice thing about integrals is that they're linear. Um, so what you can do is in, in, um, embed the flux field in, in here, um, um, in, in, exchange, interchange integration and summation, um, and then it turns out that you can get a uh, basis function representation in the mole fraction field, um, where basically uh, each basis function in the flux field has a corresponding basis function in the mole fraction field. You can write that a bit more succinctly in the, in the bottom equation where you stack everything up in vectors and matrices. Um, and, and then you end up, turns out you have a linear equation in the mole fraction field with, um, with respect to uh, the scaling factors. So you can start to imagine that we can, we can solve this. Um, um, finally, um, I'll just mention, this is where the multidisciplinary part comes in. Uh, there are lots of quantities that you need to supply to this system. You need to supply prior mean fluxes, basis functions, uh, and we get those from um, other scientists who um, have themselves attempted to um, um, estimate through other me methods um, what the fluxes might be. So they, these are called inventories. So for fossil fuels, I think I already mentioned that you can use um, proxy data um, um, of energy usage. So, so that's where you can get that. Um, for fires, you use satellite data and then there are a whole bunch of other things. Um, and these, these form these inventories um, and, and we really get a lot of help from the atmospheric chemists in our field to choose these and use them. Um, and then in the mole fraction field, you, you have to compute a prime mean of the mole fraction field and you also have to compute the basis functions. And we use a um, what's called an atmospheric transport model, uh, which is in particular, we use Geoschem, and that has to be driven by meteorological fields. So, so that there are just so many objects in this, in this problem. And that's why you really need a multidisciplinary team when you're, when you're solving this kind of problem. Um, but yeah, back to stats. So we estimate the parameters using Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, that gives us a posterior distribution over all the unknowns in the model. Um, and then we can um, calculate um, functionals of those unknowns and get, get posterior distributions of those too. So all the, all the cool stuff you get when you have a Monte Carlo based um, method. Um, yeah, so that's probably enough about the model. Uh, now I can just very briefly talk about results. Um, so first, a simulation study. Um, we One of the features that I haven't talked a lot about but that, that I mentioned is that in Wombat, there's a bias correction and correlated error term. Uh, we wanted to see, so not everyone in this community who does flux inversion um, does these. So we wanted to see um, um, how important they were. So we simulated data where they were biased and they, ha they had correlated errors. And we found that actually these are really important. Um, um, flux estimation was severely impacted if, if you don't take these features into account, um, um, up, up to three times worse um, than, than, if you, than if you do take them into account. So, so um, we were happy to see that, that, that these features were, were so important. Um, and we did other simulation studies, of course, but I won't talk about them now. Um, I'll talk about the results. Uh, so nearly done. Um, uh, so we used Wombat um, and applied it to real data. Um, two years, in fact, of OCO2 data, the satellite data that we already mentioned, um, and estimated fluxes for those two years. Uh, and the two years were um, uh, 2015 and 2016. Uh, and, and just to point out a technicality, we, we assume that fossil fuel fluxes were known when, when we did this. It's a really common assumption because they are considered to have much lower scientific uncertainty um, um, than the natural fluxes. Uh, so the, the focus here was really on estimating natural, natural fluxes. Uh, and, and I guess I'll just show you them. Um, so, so what we'll see here, so I'll play this, this is another video, I'll play this in a second. Um, I've called it the breathing earth um, for reasons that you'll see. Um, but on, on the left is a map of um, the uh, posterior estimated non-fossil fuel fluxes, so excluding fossil fuels. Uh, so mostly natural fluxes 
um, for each month. Um, and then on the right, so it's the average for the grid cell in that month. Uh, and these are our posterior estimates. Um, on the right is the posterior estimated global total non-fossil fuel flux. So you basically add up all of the CO2 in every grid cell. Um, and, and, and you'll see, you know, there's actually a lot here. So this is pedigrams of carbon. I mean, that's a lot of carbon once you add it all up. Um, so I'll just play the animation. Uh, yeah, so what you see are uh, that different things are happening at different times of the year. Um, so uh, in, um, in the Northern Hemisphere uh, winter, the trees drop their leaves and, and, and they, they decompose well, in, in the fall or autumn, um, they decompose. And then in the spring, the trees grow them back. And this process both releases and then sucks carbon back in, uh, which is really the main driver of the seasonal cycle. Um, the tropics are also participating um, both in terms of um, fires that are occurring there, but also in response to other things that are going on. Um, harder to see the oceans, but there's a, the oceans do participate quite a lot. Um, there's just a, they're not so intense in any particular location, but there's a really large um, surface area. So the net totals a lot. Um, yeah, so those are our estimates. Um, so I'm just, that's about what I had to show you. So. Um, yeah, I've told you about Wombat. That's our flux inversion system built on statistical principles. You've seen some of the results. Um, we have some planned future work. We want to do better with some of the uncertainties. We want to estimate fluxes at finer scales, including in our region of, around Australia and New Zealand. Um, we want to look at other trace gases as well. Um, so I guess watch this space, and, and I'm putting this image from the Nullarbor of this famous sign, you know, Wombat's next um, 100 kilometres. Um, um, and yeah, that's, that's all I have. So um, thank you very much for your time.